So hi, I'm Stefan. Um, as Sarah said, I'm organizing a meetup in Linz. It's called Rust Linz. Has anybody in here heard of Rust Linz? Oh, great. That's nice. Fantastic. Ah, oh, cool. Uh, so we have a very small meetup. I guess we have about 10 people in Linz or something like that. To see that, that people here know it, that's, that's, that really means a lot to me. Um, and ever since you know, we started two years ago, it was because we wanted to learn Rust. We wanted to be... Uh, we were excited. It was interesting. Uh, we wanted to start out to have a beginner's group. Um, and um, yeah, ever since um, we... we um, we not only started out learning it, but we actually adopted Rust. So at the company I work for, Dynatrace, we now have one or two Rust projects in there, and they are quite nice. So um, first of all, um, Rust enables us to do things that we didn't think we were able to do before. This is actually the project um, that we are working on. We are developing our own JavaScript runtime. First of all, cool. Second, uh, it's, it's very interesting because it's a couple of, of use cases that we couldn't do otherwise. Uh, what we do here is that we get events from some event source, um, either um, an HTTP event, like a request or something, or maybe on AWS Lambda, or maybe somewhere in some process. And we need to be able to execute arbitrary JavaScript code on those places. Uh, therefore, we create two modes. One mode is called application mode, which means that you have the files on disk, you load the file and execute it. And the other mode is called ad hoc mode, which is even more interesting because you can send a JavaScript workload uh, to the runtime and it ex executes it. So it doesn't know which code it will execute. It just comes through an event. It needs to be able to execute it and produce a result. So we have those two modes and run into a worker. And the worker is based on Google's V8. There are really nice Rust bindings out there that we use. Uh, and that's about it. So we create everything in front and use the V8 bindings uh, back there. And, you know, it's, Dynatrace now has about 1,500 developers, and we are, we are like those five Rust developers within the crowd, which is really, really interesting. Um, and it's also a little bit of a prestige project, which means people look at this code base and want to participate. So instead of bug filings, we get pull requests. This is really, really nice. Um, and people, people play with it. So once we changed that, the structure of how we load files, from the disk and somebody sent us these pull requests. Uh, they wanted to get the directories where the files are recursively from a root directory. They wanted to make sure that it really is the right function. So they did, of course, a classic code comment, get directories recursively <laughs> from root directory. So you can, you can throw all your code comment memes at me right now. They all fit here. It's fantastic. Like the cat in front of the cat sign. All of that. Um, but what's even more interesting than the comment above the function is the comment below the function. I'm using a non-recursive approach. <laughs> the function name might be misleading. <laughs> so close. <laughs> but you know, uh, so it's, it's easy to laugh about it, but please don't make fun about it because it's, yeah, first of all, it's cute, isn't it? So it's, it's really nice because I guess we all have been at that point where we looked at, at code that we're writing and realized that we are aiming for something entirely different than we started out. And, and it was never more obvious, obvious than here. So code is evolving, and this is a good thing. We start out with something totally different and end up with something that, yeah, that further down the road was actually what we were aiming for. And this change is inevitable. inevitable, inevitable. Uh, and especially if you are new to a programming language like Rust. So Rust always has uh, this moniker that it is a hard programming language or hard to learn. I don't know if it's hard to learn or if the programming language is hard to learn or if it's just your program and you just are not allowed to cut that corner. So instead of thinking about good software design, when you start out with a programming language like that, you will most likely spend more time fighting the borrow checker, learn about those wrapper types, all that stuff that you that you, yeah, leave those comments in there. I don't think about the function names. And today, I want to go with you through a piece of code from our code base um, that ended up very worrying for us. So it gave us a lot of headaches. It was very hard to maintain. It was one big main function uh, where basically all the knowledge was in there. And we tried to refactor it over time to make more reason out of it. A little disclaimer to protect the innocent um, and, and also our uh, our NDA from the company. Um, the examples that you see here today are fictional, but they're rooted in reality. So the patterns that I'm going to show you 
um, the, the, the starting point that I'm going to show you, they are all rooted in reality. Some of this code has ended up in our code base, um, and we started out to refactoring over the course of a couple of weeks. So here it is. This is the function. Can you read it in the back? Everything okay? Yeah, cool. So, hey, Stefan, what's up with you? What's the problem? It fits on a slide. <laughs> Actually, it doesn't, so I cut off a little portion down at the end. I don't know if you, if you realize that. Also, um, I removed about 200 lines of code monitoring, uh, of monitoring code in there. So it is already the reduced version. And so one thing, why would we want to refactor that? Uh, even if it's a behemoth of code, and even you see all those indentation there and lots of colors, comments, strings, whatever, um, I guess you can at least see the colors. Um, we need a good reason to change that. So if you don't have this good reason to change it, just use your editor's collapse feature, click on it, never look at it, put a blanket on it, it's nice, it does what it does, but hey, as long as you didn't, don't need to change anything, we are good. The problem is, is we, if we need to change something. And this was the main entry point for communicating with the worker. It's called an event handler. It takes the event, it splits up everything, produces a nice package, sends it to the worker, and gets the result back. So this is what's happening here. So we were constantly in this function, all the time. We were constantly working with it, and we faced a couple of problems. Like, first, it's overwhelming. So if you, if you think this isn't overwhelming, please come talk to me after the break. <laughs> I, I, want, I want to really discuss it with you. So there's also lots of indentation, which means it's really hard to navigate. So I, I really have a hard time running through this code and figuring out what's happening. As we're going to see in just a second, there are very unclear responsibilities, lots of similarities, and it's hard to keep in mind what's happening. So I, I have a really hard time to keep a mental map of my code in my head. And it's even worse if I look at the code written by others. So the code needs to talk to me and not I just to the code. And this is what refactoring is all about. So in that case, we really needed to touch this piece of code because lots of trouble there, lots of problems, lots of, of panics because we used unwrap at one point in time or maybe 130 points in time, I counted. Um, so yeah, big problem. First trick to get into refactoring is to collapse everything on the first level. So this is a really great feature from your editor. You just click on the carré on the left side and it collapses everything. And now we can at least figure out something what's happening here in this code. We get some configuration from somewhere, that's okay. And then we have two modes. So I told you about the application mode and the ad hoc mode. And we can see the application mode in there. So it's here on the line, it says mode app, cool. This is the application mode, we can figure that out. Um, and then the else if and the else is a little bit, little bit weird, where's, where's the ad hoc mode? Is it the else branch, is it the else if branch? So why do I need another condition there? This is what I meant with unclear responsibilities. Um, I assume the else if branch is going into the ad hoc mode uh, because the else if branch actually has more code than the else branch. This is, this is why, why I figured that out. What's also interesting here is that this function returns a result. So there might be errors. Errors can be happening. Either I get a result or I don't. I get an error. This is what the function signature tells me. So let's dive in into the application mode. And in the application mode, the next if statement or if expression. Apparently, as I figured out, we are not only executing JavaScript, we are also checking if our JavaScript application is healthy, which means it doesn't produce any error, which is I mean, it's JavaScript. We, we, we could argue that this function could be deleted, or this part of it could be deleted anyways, because errors are very typically in, in JavaScript. So we have this health endpoint, and there's also a lot of code in there. And I just look at the first thing that kind of that kinda seems odd to me. And this is this part here. I hope you can see it all the way in the back. I tried my best to make it as big as possible. But here, we are calling the evaluate function from a worker. So apparently we can evaluate code there. This is what we learn. And then we look if the worker result has an error. So what it does is we look for a bunch of files, we evaluate them, and if there is an error, we just return the error and break, break the evaluation. So we found an error, let's just call it a day. And what's weird here is so we check if it is an error, and then we unwrap the error, then we convert the error, and then we pack it in again. So this is all, but this, you know, if you're not used to error types in Rust, this is what you end up with. You're just using Rust Analyzer, you dot as much as long as, as Rust doesn't, doesn't give you any errors anymore, or any compil compilation errors, 
And that's why you end up with structs like that, especially if you don't know things like, for example, the question mark operator, which takes what you have here and you bubble it up. It does the same thing. It, it converts the error that we have in the error that we described above, which is this catch-all error that we had here. And suddenly it becomes a little bit smaller and much, much clearer what's happening. So you start looking for those question marks because this is an operation that might error and you just bubble it up. Down there we have the response. It kind of looks like, like HTTP, so we have a status code, which is okay. It's EO16, fine. There are no headers, there is nobody, uh, but this is the struct that we are returning. We see it for the first time. One thing that is odd, though, is that especially this struct with a status code, okay, with no body, no header, like this instance of a struct, is repeated over and over again in this function. So we have it three times, maybe four times. And it's always in cases where we think, okay, I did my task, I just want you to know I'm ready, I'm done. There's nothing that happened in particular, it's just that I finished my operation. This sounds to me like a default. This sounds to me like something that should happen in the default case. That's why I take this default trait and I implement it for the handler result. It's, it's the same thing. So the, the, the struct that we return is just the same, but we wrap it in a default trait. And now instead of that, we can write handler result default. So, okay, it avoids redundancy. We're abstracting something away. But we could use functions for that, or well, I don't know, something that we convert from and to, it, it doesn't matter. Why we are using the default trait is, has a reason. The reason is that we want to communicate intent. The default trait says that we think this is our default state. This is what should happen if nothing extra or particularly different happens. And we have three or four occasions where this default trait uh, um, is necessary. And this is actually what abstraction is all about. It's not only to reduce code and avoid redundancy, but we want to provide semantics and context. We hide the unnecessary parts and provide the important parts. I don't, I don't care if the status code is okay in the U16. I just want to know what is the default, what can I return in case I don't know what to return. And this is what we created with the default trait. We are not done with the function yet. Um, there's still this part, so where we load the code from a file. It's, it's a path path. Um, and then we need the file name. So this is, this is a, a V8 thing, um, the JavaScript engine that we use underneath. It needs to work on files. Um, and that's why we need to provide a file name, even though it's just, we, we just came up with it. It can be any name, even if it's a virtual file, but it needs, it needs a name. So what we do is we, we take the path name where we load the file and get out this this last name of the file name, like script.js or whatever. And there are lots of conversions there. You know, we start out with a path path, um, then um, we get the dot file name, which gives us an OS string. We map that to a real string, and then we hope that this operation was okay and produced a result. Like we have an unwrap, it totally failed. And then we call to string again to get an own string because we need to pass it to the worker. First thing first, um, this might error. Even though you think this might be a safe operation because it never errors, this might error. Let's at least provide a default or some other, uh, some other name uh, instead of just unwrapping it. But then again, this code also comes up over and over and over again in our code base. In the health check, in the actual execution, even in the ad hoc function, because you know in the ad hoc function we also need to provide a file, even though we just have a workload from somewhere. We don't have a real physical file. So this is a process where we have a certain set of semantics that we want to do with this particular string. It suddenly is not just a string anymore, but it is to us a file name. And for me, this sounds like a very important detail, which why I introduce a struct for it. So I introduce this file name struct. It's a tuple struct, it just contains one value. It's just here to wrap this value that I originally had. Instead of having a primitive type, now I have my own type. It says something. So now I'm not only dealing with file names, but I can also say, well, this is the script file name, or this is the ad hoc script file name. So I can, in the, in the variable name, I can be much, much more expressive, and in the type, I see and I understand what it's all about. So we separate the knowledge a little bit, on, not only on the variable name, but also on the file name. And what's with the implementation? So first we create the conversion implementation from path path to file name. So 
for me, this is really beautiful because it, it reads like English. How do I come from a path buff to a file name? It says it right there. That's so great. And then I have this operation that I had earlier. But again, abstraction, I focus on what's important for my, for my application to run. And I hide away all the other details. And then we have another conversion trait. How do I get from a file name to a string? Because this is what I need in the runtime. And with those traits, with, again, I communicate intent. I communicate what I want to achieve with that. And the file name in particular becomes something from my domain, something from my semantics. And for the other case, I can implement default again. I can say, so in all other cases, please use that. That's OK. OK, so we have this thing. We can reduce this part. Our health check now is super small, five lines that tells us exactly what's happening. And even if we, you know, if we can manage to get file name through the entire code base, we even end up with a couple of less intos. That's nice. So, so really, really great. So what did we achieve? We introduced defaults. We made good use of error boundaries with the question mark operator. And we introduced our own type. But there's more for our refactoring story. We learned, we learned that we need to work with files and code. We learned that we can send HTTP responses back. And we learned that errors can happen. So we learned a little bit about the domain of the function. And we can apply this knowledge to all the other parts. Speaking of creating our own types, um, this is something in the configuration section that happens over and over and over again. We have a hash map. We look in this hash map if a certain key exists. If it exists, we get it, and we convert it to something that can be owned, so we can add it to some configuration over and over and over again. And the problem is that you know, a hash map requires us to take those steps to get to this, uh, this content. And this is lots of extra information that we also might want to abstract away. Um, for us, it's not necessary to understand what's going on there. And if you want to make changes, we would need to make those changes everywhere and everywhere again. So again, I introduce my own type again to abstract this. First, I create the header error, because it can error, and I want to have my own error to make sure that I know what was wrong. Uh, header errors are pretty easy to, to implement. Create a struct, it can be empty. Add the debug trait on top of it, the error trait on top of it, the display trait on top of it, and you have your error, your own error. And then I create again a struct, like a tuple struct before. It contains my hash map. I create a new one. And then I have two functions, get required header and get optional header, two methods on the struct. And they tell me exactly what's happening. It's a required header, so it can produce a result. It can fail. It can error. It's an optional header. So well, it can be absent, but it also might be possible that you have some. And just with file name, we added our own semantics on top of a standard data type. The characteristics of the data type move to the back. And our own domain moves forward. Our goals move forward. Again, abstraction. Hide the unnecessary parts and provide information for the necessary parts. But headers is a little bit different than file name. With file name, we also have this carrier structure that we can carry around through our code base and we unwrap it when, when we see it fit. For headers, we are actually more concerned about, um, about the methods, not, not about the actual values. Um, actually, it would be nice if HashMap, for example, would have this feature, this characteristic. But there I say it is trait. So I, instead of creating a header struct, I create the header trait, and I implement the header trait for the HashMap. The same functions, just within my scope, I can now treat the HashMap like headers. And if I want to change the implementation of headers, like not the HashMap anymore, but something other, super fancy, I can just do it. My code just stays the same, because I'm communicating with headers not with the hash map anymore. Um, and this is how I use it. So instead of, instead of having all those ifs and unwraps and, and mappings, I just get required headers with the question mark operator error propagation again, or I get optional headers. Again, I understand what's going on there. I talk in my own domain. I talk within the knowledge of my application and not handle around some arbitrary data types that I think I need. OK, OK. Now for the main act. <sighs> Let's get to the big one. Let's get to the application function where we pass some results. So um, I, I'm pretty sure you can't see it in the back. I'm very sorry, but uh, it's OK. I, I highlight a couple of parts and tell you what's happening there. First of all, here, so first of all, it almost fits on a slide. <laughs> very nice. Um, we have a file name up there. And again, file name we already had that we can use our own struct for that. So we can use that one to use the file name struct. Now, a little bit more comes into scope here. Next, here, um, this is where we have 
an option value and we map it to another option value. If we use the right APIs from the option struct, we can reduce this to one line instead of four. This is also nice. And now something comes into scope, which is a default handler result. We also have a struct for that. We can call handler uh, result colon colon default and we reduce that as well. And now I think, oh no, now we have two more things. We have two very interesting functions. So we have a worker that is executed and then we have two mapping functions. First of all, we have the mapping function if the case is okay. And then we have the mapping function if we have an error. And since we use good error propagation, we just can reduce the whole mapping, use proper error propagation, like bubble up the error and work with the happy part. So this is what error propagation and the error trait is all about. If you had a question mark, you can't just work like you would always work with no errors and just propagate the errors to somebody else. Somebody else will take care of that. That's fine. But you can work like there will be no errors. And now it fits on a slide. So this is great. Now, if we put both code parts next to each other. There are some similarities, but I fear, well, I'm not quite sure if we can change something there. So we can move around a couple of things, that's okay. Um, there are some things that you can figure out, like there's a clear distinction between an error and the result within the worker result, but it's not an actual error or an actual result. Um, this is because in an ad hoc execution, you can have a JavaScript piece that produces a result, but also produces errors. It's, it, it's JavaScript, this can happen. So you can still run it even though you log an error somewhere. And this is what we want to communicate. This is why in the OK case, if something works, we can still have errors. I know. Um, but all in all, I, I guess that's it for reductions. But if you look at it, even though they look so different, we can figure out a couple of things that they have in common. They have a piece of code. They have a file name. They work with the payload, and once they are done with the execution, they need to pass the result. And if I look at it from that perspective, this harks back some memories from my computer science class. We have the same preconditions, we have the same properties, but they are executed only slightly differently. And this is also the presumption of a strategy pattern. So question to the audience, who knows about the design patterns of object-oriented design by the Gang of Four? Okay, okay, that's, that's a lot, that's great. So um, me too, I learned it in computer science class and I tried to avoid it for decades, basically, because I had so such bad memories and such bad experiences with, from mostly Java code bases where you try to get every design pattern somehow crammed in. But actually in Rust, I have the feeling that they are really, really nice and they work really, really well because they were designed for composition over inheritance. Composition is great in Rust, inheritance not so much. And we just seen it with Raphael's talk. He also used the builder pattern over and over again, which is a really good pattern for those kind of things. So I want to create a, a strategy pattern where I say, I have this executed, it just takes care that the right things are executed, but they can rely on different strategies calling event strategy. So I model my event strategy and look at that. It's, what do I have here? I have a file name. I have the code. I get a payload and I can pass the result. That's what's happening here. They're again the same four parts, but now condensed in this piece um, that tells me what I expect from the attack strategy or from the app strategy. And if we remove all the colors, the functions speak to me, the methods speak to me. I understand that if I call the file name method, I get a file name. And it, I will always get a file name because it's not wrapped in a result or in an option or something like that. I can be sure that I get a file name. I can't be sure that I get a code, this might error, but if I get a code, it's of type string. So suddenly I understand a lot, lot more about what's going on in both strategies without needing to pass every line of code. Let's try to implement the ad hoc strategy. So I'm try to, to take a look at the watch. Uh, what it does, it takes a handler event, this is what I get in, and tries to create an ad hoc task out of it. This is a struct that I already had. I really don't care about what I get in and, and what, what it stores. I care more about that I have a try from trait where I can tell, well, I try to generate this struct for you. I try to establish this strategy for you. It might fail, but if it doesn't fail, I have a strategy I can work with. 
So this is where I do all the parsing for those two elements, for code and for the, I guess, for the payload. And then I have the implementation of the trade itself, of the event strategy trade. And look at that, so almost every, every method here is a one-liner, except the one where I pass the result, but it got condensed so much that I can finally figure out what's happening there. And the same goes for, um, for the uh, app strategy, or application strategy. I just don't want to write it because it doesn't fit on the slide. Now I understand that each part in my code, what's happening. I implement the executor, the executor takes an event strategy, and what it does, look at it, it gets a file name, it gets some code, it gets a payload, and then it calls the executor, and once the executor is done, it passes the result. So suddenly, all those steps and all those preconditions that I need are clear, I can read them. It's very, very clear what I expect. You know what that is? That's the original event handler function refactored. It fits on a slide. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> it's so great. And, and it's now a lot, lot clearer what's happening. I'm creating a configuration. That's nice. It, it actually doesn't look that different. It just got reduced. But it's nice. I understand that the configuration is happening here. Then based on some input, I don't even need to care which input it is. I create a strategy, either an application strategy or an ad hoc strategy. And now look at that. There's no if, else, if, else branch anymore. I have a match statement. I take care of every mode in my enum, which means that if I add a mode or remove a mode, I get an error here. This is nice. And if I have the error case, I just propagate the errors up. I don't need to handle the error explicitly anymore. This is what's happening here. So I create a strategy. This is great. What's happening next? I fill the executor with the strategy, and if I have this health endpoint, I evaluate the code, otherwise I execute the code. This function is not totally clear what's happening. I can give this to somebody, along, of course, with the domain knowledge of my application, and they can understand what's going on there. Best thing is, we won't change this function anymore. You know, I know famous last words, we definitely will change it, but not that often anymore. If we want to create new features or introduce new stuff in it, we can do it in all the other parts of our application. So hey, was it worth it? So I think yes. Um, first of all, we got all, rid of all potential panics. This is great. And we have proper error propagation. Let somebody else take care of your error. We can change things where they, where they belong. So we have much faster iterations. If we introduce TypeScript support, which we do, then we change the code part in our strategies. If we want to change where we pick files in the application strategy, we can take the get directories recursively function and put it in the code base, a code part of the application strategy. Also great, we can now test all our features in isolation. We can test the strategies in isolation. We can test the executor with mock strategies. This is also possible. And contributions are much, much easier because the code communicates clearly. If you know what we try to do, and maybe see an architecture diagram, or maybe just talk to, to this person at the coffee machine who works at the company for five years and has done all that. You know what we are up to. There's still a lot to do. So, well, you've seen a couple of RCs here and there. You maybe um, um, have seen that I uh, use trade objects, which I question if we need that, but that, that are all optimizations. Um, we also have a couple of clones in there, but. Those are all optimizations that we can do later. We can figure out our ownership. We can figure out all those parts. But it's much, much easier to figure out now that we have a clear code base and something where we actually see what's happening. So is it better? I think so. Is it the best solution? I don't, I don't know. So this is something that I came up with. Uh, folks from my team came up with something different, but with the same effect. So uh, many ways lead to Rome. Um, and this was just one way where I guess, yeah, I guess we made it, we made it a little better. So, main takeaways. Have proper error handling, write for the happy path. This is what you want. Work with default and con conversion traits to communicate intent. They are provided from the standard library to you, and you can use them to tell yourself and your, uh, your uh, colleagues what you actually want to achieve. Use custom traits and types to abstract for your semantics, or for the semantics of your application. 
And with that, I want to say thank you. I'm Stefan, I'm here all day, and it's very nice to speak in front of a Rust audience. Thank you.